The academically gifted students, you know the ones that I'm talking about, they're the poindexes at the front of the class that can't put their hands down. They've got an answer for every question. They're the teacher's pet. They're the one in a million Lisa Simpsons and Sheldon Coopers of the world, right? They're the ones that, despite anything, they're going to succeed and do well just by virtue of their natural talents and abilities. Yep. Well, actually, about 50% of gifted students are thought to be underachieving, and up to 40% will drop out of school altogether. This is based on three centre inquiries here in Australia and a number of studies and reports in the US, here, and around the world. But how can that be? That, that doesn't compute. They're highly academically gifted, but they're academically struggling, underperforming, underachieving. How can that be? Before I go into that, I'll just tell you quickly what I mean by gifted. So, in Australian educational settings, the term gifted normally applies to people whose IQ is in the top 10% or the 90th percentile of their age bracket. So, at a school with about 100, uh, 1,500 kids, you should have a gifted program with 150 students. In a class of 20 or 30 kids, you're going to have, on average, two or three gifted students in that class whether they've been identified or not. Now, I'm going to tell you about three young people, uh, and I want you to listen to their stories and have a think about maybe which one is the gifted one. So firstly, we've got Ian. In year four, Ian hates school. He's angry, he's destructive, he's disruptive. He will throw books, he'll throw furniture. He'll argue with the teacher, saying, this is stupid, I hate it, school's dumb, I want to get out. And it got to the stage where the school had him referred to a school for disturbed children. Luke, eight years old, his parents described his behaviour at home as normal. At school, it was a different story. He would hide under his desk and refuse to come out. Instead of doing his classwork, He'd roll around on the floor. Uh, he would burst into song loudly during class. Not necessarily words, but a tune. And rather than going to class, he would run around the school screaming. Needless to say, he was mainly achieving Ds in the classwork that he did do, and so his teachers asked the parents to have him taken away for an assessment of ADHD. And Stephanie. She was a great student all the way through primary school. She had an academic record that she was very proud of. She was on good terms with all the teachers. Uh, she enjoyed violin, creative writing, drawing, painting. But when she got into year seven, she sort of hit an academic brick wall. She got a B. And then after that, she got a C. And so a little while later, she just stopped handing in her work. And then she started missing school. Parents and teachers thought, maybe it's adolescence. Maybe it's depression. It's just teenagehood. So which one of these students is gifted? Let's look at what happened to Ian. So he's the angry year four student. It looks like what some people would call oppositional defiance disorder. Um, during his, so he was sent off to that school for disturbed children, uh, and before he went, he had to be, uh, he had to see a psychologist and have a battery of psychometric tests, and one of those was an IQ test. The result of that was that his IQ was 170. Now, 100 is the average, 170 is off the charts. To put it in perspective, you would need about a thousand people his age before you found one with a comparable IQ. His mind was at the level of an 18-year-old. So he could very well have been doing high school topics, but he was having to colour in and read Pulp Fiction books with pictures in them <laughs> and wrote Learn the Times tables. So of course he was frustrated, of course he was angry, of course he wanted to get out of there. Luke, uh, he did go away to a psychologist to be assessed for ADHD, and they also had an IQ test for Luke. 
that came back showing that he was in the top 1% of IQ for his age group, in the 99th percentile. So what was happening with Luke was he was bored. He was unchallenged. He was disengaged, and he had to make his own fun, really. <laughs> what happened was once he was identified, the school was able to bring in a curriculum for him that's based on one that they use in Singapore, uh, which allowed him to stay in the same class, and he got a bit more challenge, a bit more depth, a bit more breadth to his work. He started enjoying school a lot more. Uh, he gained confidence. He built friendships. He took up swimming and playing chess and started learning the piano. Two terms later, that boy who rolled around on the floor and ran around the school screaming, wrote a four-page story in English, something that no one would have ever expected. And Stephanie, she's also likely to be gifted, um, but her underachievement stems from her sense of perfection. And that could be a topic for a TEDx talk all on its own. But what's happened here is she's transitioned into high school where there's uh, different teachers, different standards, different peers, and she's never experienced failure before. So she's never had to build resilience to failure. So she didn't know how to cope with it. And when she got knocked back with this grade that wasn't an A+, plus, that destroyed her self-concept of being the perfect student. So all three of these students are gifted. But the important thing here to realise is that they come in different shapes and sizes and that these are students with additional learning needs. They're not going to thrive without the right support. And as we can see, in fact, it's quite the opposite. So we've got different types of gifted underachiever. There was a researcher, Del Siegel, who synthesised a lot of research in this area. One of the researchers that he wrote about was um, Dr Sylvia Rim. And she came up with this very helpful matrix for identifying the different types of gifted underachiever. So on this matrix, we've got the vertical axis, which is um, their conformity level, going from non-conformist up to conformist, and across the bottom, their um, confidence from dependent to dominant. So when I go through these types of um, kids, you might think, hey, that sounds a bit like my kids or my students, or I was like that when I was young, or I'm like that now. So we'll start off with the dominant conformers up in the top right quadrant. This is where you find those students who are the jocks, the socialites, the dramatists. They are successful on the social scene, and they choose extracurricular activities that they know they're going to excel at. That's sport, drama, singing, and they're very capable students. They can learn the material, but they choose not to perform to their top standard because they don't want to be labelled as a nerd and ostracised from their social group. So these students need to understand that having high grades and being popular aren't mutually exclusive. When we go and look at the dominant non-conformers, we've got the kids that are labelled as rebellious, hyperactive, and the class clown. So these students, um, you know, sometimes they're manipulative, they're very cluey, and they can be the bane of a teacher's existence for probably an unexpected reason. They have something that's a characteristic of a lot of gifted people, a, a strong sense of moral justice. If they see an injustice, which might be to them uh, an unfair rule, an unfair punishment, or an award being given out without merit, they would rather lose out or fail or be hurt than to let that injustice stand. So we normally find this type of student in the corridor or in front of the principal's office waiting to be spoken to. Sometimes they'll turn into bullies from a, a sense of low self-esteem, um, but they will defy and challenge authority figures because they feel like they've been let down. Okay, so as we slide along to the um, dependent side, we find the dependent non-conformers. And these students, they've just got too much on their mind, really, um, to be able to concentrate on school. School pales in significance to the things that are happening in their life. So we have Torn Thomas here in the middle. Torn Thomas has just got so much going on. He's got debating, he's got drama, he's got sports, he's got a big family. 
he just doesn't have the cognitive space to devote to school. Uh, there's too much other stuff sucking that up. Depressed Donna, she is so forlorn, probably ruminating on these big social issues, global um, problems that she probably can't do much about. But school is just a, such an insignificant thing to her compared to these bigger uh, issues going on that she can't or won't focus on it. And Sick Sam, he's the kid that's always sick on test day or, you know, when the assignment's due, just happens to have a tummy bug. Now, his illness might be made up or it could be a psychosomatic response. He's so stressed, so anxious, so panicky about being assessed that he makes himself physically ill. Up in the dependent conformist is poor Polly. Now, she might be a victim of bullying, she has low self-esteem, and she's constantly seeking validation and reassurance from um, adults and teachers. Passive Paul is another interesting character who he's essentially just given up. School hasn't been giving him what he was promised. He's not getting the challenge, he's not getting the rigour. So he does the bare minimum he needs to do, and you won't get anything else out of him. He just wants to pass and get out of there. And perfectionist Pearl, this kind of student, she has a crippling, um, a crippling fear of failure. They thrive in, a, in, a, in an organisation that's got rigid structure and organisation, but you give this kind of student a an abstract thought or an open-ended assignment, and no, just not happening. These kinds of students can very quickly devolve into um, a sick Sam or an academic Alice. And these types of students are like Stephanie that we saw earlier. Um, they set such high, impossibly high expectations for themselves that when something happens or they hit a brick wall, or they just get knocked back in some way, they, they can't handle it. Um, and everything that they, they interpret as being a failure, so a B seems like a failure, to these types of students, a B is tantamount to an F. And they start to think, if I can't be perfect, if I can't get A pluses all the time, then I may as well fail. I may as well just not try. If you don't try and you fail, then at least you've got an excuse. Well, I didn't do that assignment. But if you put in effort and it comes back and you only got a B, well, then that's on you. That, that can destroy their whole self-identity. And these students need to build resilience. They need to build confidence in themselves and learn coping strategies. So, so what? Who cares? Um, why am I here talking to you about this? Well. Hopefully, I've challenged your idea, this concept of giftedness, um, that they're not these walking encyclopedias that are rare unicorns out there. It's 10% of the population. And I can tell you, they're hiding amongst us, OK? Um, they're, they're not um, figments of your imagination. They could be the people that you least expect. It could be you. So what are we going to do? When you come across a person that's like Luke or Ian or Stephanie, don't be so quick to pathologise. Don't just say, this kid's got issues with discipline. This kid's got ADHD. We're going to send them off and, um, and pathologise this, um, this behaviour. What we need to do is say, well, why are they behaving this way? What are they lacking in their education? What supports do they need? Maybe they need more challenge. Maybe they need more rigour. Maybe they need more depth. It's just uh, not getting through to you. It's not um, engaging. So um, what we need to do is engage them. How do we find out what they need? We ask them. These are individuals. They're young people. They know what they need in their education. They know what they need in their social life. They know what's missing. So let's talk to these, uh, these young people because when we identify what they need and when we put the supports in place, they will thrive, they will flourish, and they will go on to do great things. Thank you.